for the stone from the top for geologists, the knowledge of the limits of endurance for the doctors, but above all, for the spirit of adventure to keep alive the soul of man, George Mallory. George Mallory is debated to be the first person to climb Mount Everest with his climbing partner, Sandy Irvine. However, they died in the attempt, and whether or not they succeeded remains a mystery. His first Everest expedition in 1922 did not succeed, and three more attempts to scale Everest in the next year also failed due to exhaustion, illness, equipment failure, and avalanches. So it's a rational question to ask, why Mallory continued to set out on the most dangerous climb in the world? Why risk your life over and over for Everest? He responded famously, because it's there. The challenge, the unconquered peak, the call to adventure, the soul of man thriving on the unknown, I believe is what he was chasing. And I wanted to chase it too. Not in the hopes of climbing Everest, but to go searching for what I would learn about the soul of man in the mountains and answer the same call Mallory and so many others hear. In this video, I'll be sharing my first mountaineering experience and the three lessons I learned while in the Cascades. This video highlights the experience my buddy Carlos and I had on a 10-day mountaineering course with Alpine Ascents in Seattle, Washington to climb Mount Baker and Mount Rainier. We ice climbed, performed crevasse rescue training, and even fought for our lives in a snowstorm. Okay. <laughs> Just gonna walk through all the things that we're gonna be actually wearing and carrying for the next 10 days. Only two to three pairs of underwear, including the one that we're wearing. Base layer bottoms. This is the only pants I'm gonna wear for the next 10 days. Got the hard shell pants. Moving on to the shirt. Technically, you're only supposed to have two base layers. So, just be a long sleeve shirt. The brand, one long sleeve sun shirt with a hoodie. Once again, from the store, hard shell jacket, renting, synthetic insulated pant renting, sun hat. I'm definitely not a hat person, and here's why. Anyways, 100 liter climbing pack, renting that. Zero degree Fahrenheit sleeping bag, renting. Inflatable sleeping bag, renting. Found that left. Hand gloves, deodorant. Apparently, if you don't wash it off, it makes your armpits very moldy. But otherwise, I'm going 10 days without deodorant, which is kind of disgusting. Wipes. Yeah? That's a good idea. Yeah, wipes. I skipped a lot of items here, but if you want a full breakdown of our gear, let me know. Spoons. Check out these freaking spoons. Dude. And that's why I stopped there. Look at all the food. All right, Carlos, why don't you walk us through what you're gonna be eating? All right, so start out the day, we got Oatmeal for Amon and I, um, two cups, and then my secret sauce. So we got some dried fruit, some cinnamon, sugar, and then some peanut butter as well that we're gonna be cooking up. Next, we're gonna move into lunch. So we got some tuna sandwiches with Parmesan. We're gonna pack some salsa as well. Um, big, bag of, big bag of sawdust here. <laughs> and then for snacks, we got trail mix, uh, fruit snacks, Extra shot blocks for trail or summer day, granola bars, um, almond joy and Reese's, pistachios and Pringles. We got some tea for the afternoon, cold tea for the afternoon, hot tea for the evening. And that is going to include for dinner, we got some freeze dried food. We got some miso soup packets and we got some Oreo packets for afterwards. And that is what we're gonna eat on Baker. My my packing doesn't look as good as Carlos's. Uh, let me just got Think Bars. Shout out to the Greenbergs for putting me on. Cliff Bars, Pringles, the pizza kind, a hot chocolate on deck, some fruit snacks, mini Oreos, Reese's Big Cups, 
and some Snickers. Oh yeah, here are my mystery meats. Check it out, check it out. The most okay thing I can eat, pink salmon. Then I got some zesty lemon pepper packet chicken, which is gonna be delicious. Buffalo chicken style slop. I don't even know. Carlos and I spent the rest of the afternoon arguing about what to bring as our nerves began to set in. Was I physically in shape enough? Was the guide going to kick me off the mountain because I didn't learn knots? How is it going to stay warm with only three to four layers in the next 10 days? I packed up my stuff quickly, throwing stuff into the bag, cluttered, disorganized, mentally and physically. Could I even hold my 70 pound bag? I would never went to camp. I drowned up my thoughts and Ubered to my hotel so we could both get some sleep for our early morning wake up call. The morning for the beginning of training. Excited, um, mostly nervous. As you can probably tell by my voice. At Gear Check, we received all our rental items and met our team of seven, and were introduced to our two guides. The plan was to head out to Heliotrope Ridgehead, right under the nose of Mount Baker, about three hours away from the Alpine Center office. Go to Twirl. Yeah. Alright, I'm on. <laughs> Our mission was to climb to Hogsback Camp, a three mile hike with 2200 feet of elevation gain. Not a terrible hike in normal conditions, but with 70 pound packs on our backs, it was not an easy walk. Our climb turned from rocky dirt into sloggy snow and eventually pure white conditions. One member unfortunately dropped out due to the physical requirements. After a quick celebration, fresh snow was waiting on the slanted hillside, and we were given shovels to begin digging. In order to set up camp, you have to dig out a platform and then use your feet to level out the ground. The out of the ground, the better you sleep. Then, after a quick tent setup, the key to a stable tent is digging snow anchors. We learned this the hard way later on. Generally, you dig into the snow about double the size of your shovel head, and then you create a little bivy for the rope to slide in. Create a dead man anchor by looping the tent string through the anchor and place it horizontally into the snow hole. The angle and the depth of the anchor has to be right or yeah, so we just keep on digging. It's honestly a pain. After re-digging a few anchors and having dinner, we called it a night. Only till about 1 a.m. when Carlos woke up to his sleeping bad deflating. On the mountain, you create separation from the ice by using a foam thermal pad and then an air pad to create space, and then your sleeping pad on top of that. His air pad popped, and we performed a surgery that we hoped was successful. Hey, Carlos. So was the uh, foam pad fixed last night? How'd you sleep? It was a chilly night. The first lesson I learned is that slow is smooth and smooth is fast. My packing skills sucked and so did my general survival skills. And that's because I was always rushing. On the mountain, it is a requirement to be present, alert, and constantly moving to keep up with the team. So if you go slow, stay in the present, and perform the next step, things will go smoothly. Yeah. All right, good morning, guys. Uh, as you can see, it's snowing pure right outside. Uh, I thought I'd continue the tour. Welcome to the restroom. Hey, Danny, toothbrush. Contacts, I'm gonna have to put these on. This is all glacier water. Beautiful toilet. Out here, the toilet is everywhere and anywhere your heart wants it to be, which is why it's five stars. Normal everyday lifestyle. 
it hit me hard that we were actually living, living on the mountain. Our air pads were our safety from a chilly night. The restroom was a good spot in between the exposed rock mounds. The tent was our home for two. Rain and snow came at variable times and we would eat the same foods on the burner and the water was crystal clear. Just got some water from the hydrometer and look what we found inside. Oh my god, what is that? Our first day we had snow school, which consisted of mountain basics such as crampon walking, how to hold an ice axe, how to arrest your fall if you slip, knots, and roping up. Then we got to experience our first walk as a rope team. Tied by the waist using butterfly knots on our harnesses, each member walks about six to seven feet apart, and usually there are three to four people to a rope team. And the views are ridiculous. Last thing about lifestyle is that you get hot when hiking very quickly and you start freezing quickly if you sit down. It also rains, snows, clears up, or wipes out randomly. Which is why the second lesson in mountaineering is... second lesson is be bold, start cold. It's better to start off cold before hiking or climbing because you will heat up as you engage in the activity and then waste time taking off layers. So if you're bold, embrace the cold and it'll serve you in the long run. I think this applies to being willing to be uncomfortable when you start something new. First you jump into the cold water and eventually you'll be alright. Preface, this may just be me convincing myself to put out this video. You ready? Super ready. Uh -huh. You want to do a little second one? Alright, belt loop. Two. Beautiful figure eight right here. I think you're pretty set. You swing with your entire arm instead of pivoting on your elbows. Also, the ice may chip off, so you have to make sure it's a solid hold. Funny thing is, you can also swing too hard and get your tools stuck in the ice. Then with the crampons on your feet, you drive the front two knives into the wall perpendicularly. If you look down, it looks like your toes are just sticking to the wall. Once you get to the top, you can just lean back, trust the rope, and rappel down just as you would in rock climbing. Thankfully, there's no more pain involved in going down. Ice climb was definitely the hardest form of climbing I've come across. My forearms felt like they wanted to jump out of my sleeves by the time I was done, and I even had a scare where I was basically dangling by two appendages N not fun or maybe fun i don't know um but i would highly recommend that you try it out if you get a chance after climbing we decided to fill up on water from the glacial runoff and then headed back to camp Fresh snow often hides big gaps under the ice. Here's a teammate who fell and climbed out of a small gap because the rope arrested her fall. And here's a big gap. The big crevasses can be hundreds of feet deep and run through jagged rock and snow. So we decided to test one out. But only for training. 
we had to set up a three-point pulley system and we had our guide set up another safety pulley to make sure that we wouldn't go for the ride of our lives. And while we were waiting in the crevasses, we decided to have a snowball fight just to calm the nerves a little bit. The rescuer on top has to perform a series of different procedures that include setting up knots, setting up carabiners, pelting you with snow to set up the actual lip of the crevasse for a rescue, and eventually you start being pulled out, slowly and surely. <laughs> Here you can see my teammate Victoria starting to bear crawl and pull me out of the crevasse. You have to keep kicking your feet into the snow to not lose your grip. Obviously it gets exhausting and she's luckily able to get me out of line. Thanks Victoria. After a long day of risking it in the crevasses, we headed back to camp to prepare for summit night. The guide said they would wake us up between 2 to 3 a.m. to climb to the top. Dude, we're gonna get buried. You think so? Yeah. Like right there. Like all the like just it's like a wall of snow. Oh, 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 oh. Dude, we gotta go outside to settle some of this out. You think so? Dude, look at that. I think it can hold. I feel like it can hold. <laughs> All right, it's 5.30 in the morning and we've been doing this now for three hours. We're fading, strong gusts of wind mixed with heavy sleet, snow and rain have kept this trapped inside our tent and now we're just trying to hold it up structurally so that it doesn't collapse and we go into weathers where we could get hypothermia carlos yeah are you having fun aye aye captain we're having a great time so yeah summit day is kind of canceled basically after staying up all night the rain finally died down around 6 a.m the guides told us later on that three tents had collapsed and some had been close to hypothermia. The campsite was quickly being abandoned, so we headed back to Seattle to receive instructions on our last climb, Mount Rainier. At the office, we started the gear exchange until our guide gave us the news. Mount Rainier is no longer safe to summit. The mountain had received fresh snow from the same storm and avalanches were now very likely. So the guides decided we would switch to Mount Shuxan which I had never heard of, and I didn't care. My dreams are crushed. I was disappointed and angry, and I couldn't care about any other mountain. So we headed up Mount Shuxan, back up the mountain, back up the steady steps, set up our tents, and unfortunately it was raining most of the time that we were climbing. We stayed there for about three days, three nights, relaxing and eating in the rain and snow. Then I learned my final lesson, 440, 400, 4000. When navigating, you start with the broad scope of direction, 4000 feet, find your orientation and turn that way. Then 400 feet, what are the obstacles that are upcoming? Then 40 feet, do we need certain gear? What is the terrain like? Finally, four feet, stay present and take the next step. That's how you navigate on a mountain and I applied it to how I was going to navigate my goal. I'd forgotten that my 4,000 feet goal was to learn what the mountains had to teach me, not just climb a name brand mountain. As I got used to the mountains, I started to find joy in the environment and remembered why I was here. So I reoriented, prepared my gear, stayed present, and got prepared to summit.
woke up at 2 a.m. since summit days require an early start because the temps are the coldest, ice is rock hard, and crampons can easily grip to the incline. Light began to peak over the mountains around 3 a.m. and we kept trudging onwards, getting closer and closer to the summit pyramid base. We eventually reached the base summit pyramid of Mount Shuksen, and then began the climb. Oh yeah, Victoria! Once at the base, our guides set up mixed top belay ropes, and we grabbed our ice axes to begin the incline. Me and Carlos were also short roped, so we were no more than two to three feet apart during the whole climb. This is full value climbing. Our guide set up a system where they would free climb and then throw the rope down for us to climb after them. So there was some waiting around during the process. Eventually though, the ice turned into rock and we were mixed climbing towards the summit peak. We made it to the top. We were excited, we were exhausted, we wanted to celebrate, but most of all, we were just grateful. We could see the Cascades all around us, the Canadian Rockies to our north, and then Mount Baker, where we had just survived a snowstorm. I was pretty hungry, so I pulled out one of my mystery meats and enjoyed a meal at the summit. And then I even got signal and somehow ended up FaceTiming my little brother. From this adventure, I dove into the call of the challenge Mallory spoke about, and I do believe there's more to be learned from the mountains. Where there's risk, there's reward, and an intensity of life that I'm continuing to seek. When Mallory was asked again about Everest, he said, the struggle is a struggle of life itself, upward and forever. What we get from this adventure is just sheer joy, and joy is, after all, the end of life. We do not live to eat and make money, we eat and make money to be able to live. So I'll be back again in the mountains soon, and I hope to continue to share my findings on my search for modern freedom. Thanks for watching.